We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. This chalice is lit as a reminder and an honor of those who've come before us, those who have passed down our free liberal religious tradition, that we may have the illumination of truth and freedom to find that truth.
Today, I want to share with you my belief box. This is the special box I have that holds everything I believe about the universe, how to be a good person, the meaning of life, and so much more. Everyone has a belief box. For most of us, it's an invisible imaginary box with lots of grand ideas inside. But I decided to create an actual physical belief box to help remind me of the values that guide me through difficult questions and situations. So let me show you just a few of the many things in my belief box. I have the eight New Year principles that help me make difficult decisions. I have stories from Unitarian Universalists who came before us whose lives and lessons I can learn from. I have a chalice that reminds me to bring my best self to the table. And I have a stone that helps me feel grounded in myself and connected to the earth and all of the beings on it. Anytime I have a tough question or when I accidentally hurt someone and need to fix it, I reach into my belief box for guidance on what to do. And if you pay attention next time you're in a tough spot, I bet you'll find yourself reaching for your belief box too. At this time, we'll dismiss all children, kindergarten through fifth grade to go to their classes. There are adults waiting for you in the back of the room. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way that we live out our mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, income equality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's collection recipient is Michigan Urban Farming Initiative, whose mission is to empower urban communities by using agriculture as a platform to promote education, sustainability, and community while simultaneously reducing socio socioeconomic disparity. Michigan Urban Farming Initiative has sent a short video to introduce themselves to our congregation. We also have a representative with us this morning, Olivia Krinzel. Olivia, can you raise your hand or did Olivia, is Olivia, okay, Olivia's not here, Never mind. Uh, but we do have a video to introduce us to uh, Michigan Urban Farming Initiative. Nestled in Detroit's North End neighborhood is three acres of land filled with 300 different varieties of produce 200 fruit trees, and a number of structures on the verge of development. It's a sight to see. What is it about urban farming that has particular appeal, especially in a city like Detroit? Greenery in an urban place is something that you don't get too often, but it's something that's very unique to Detroit. We help tackle the food insecurity that is in Detroit by providing fresh produce to people who don't have it. Michigan Urban Farming Initiative has been in the North End since 2011. It's the vision of founder Tyson Gersh. Through the support of grants, fundraising, and thousands of hardworking volunteers, Muffy is able to provide all produce to the neighborhood free of charge. 80% of the produce gets back into the community, and then that other 20% goes to churches or food pantries, which also might be in the neighborhood. This oasis has become quite the destination for locals and international visitors. All who walk the grounds quickly realize that the benefit of the garden goes beyond just fresh produce. 
just being in this open space with the plants, I think it's very calming and therapeutic, but then the other half is just meeting all the interesting people. And so just to see people taking the produce, the tomatoes specifically, mm -hmm. really puts a smile on my face. So as it goes away, so there goes one of my prized yeah, tomatoes. Hey, I know that tomato. <laughs> So let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world that we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. The ushers will now come forward so we can dedicate our offering. You know, one of the good things about being here is that everything is the same, but it's also totally different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the fork. There you go. Okay. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation, and we dedicate ourselves to its service. We come now to the time in our service that is set aside for prayer, centering, gratitude. We begin with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our congregation. We start, this is all really good news today, I'm really excited. We start with a joy from Tom Cranston and the rest of the Cranston Haynes family. Our family is filled to the brim with happiness following the news of a healthy, happy arrival of baby Ben my third grandson and my daughter's first child on Saturday afternoon. His grandmother and I, daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren, Sam and Fiona, have looked forward to this day for a long time and thrilled to welcome him to our family and witness the joy that he has brought his parents. You know, you can just clap, it's okay. <laughs> We have another joy from Eric and Annette Sargent, uh, whose son, William, was honored as Volunteer of the Year at the annual Lighthouse Night of Inspiration on Thursday. And they say that they're very proud of him. And we are too. <laughs> and finally, we have a third joy from Lindsay Hansman. Lindsay says, after almost 16 years of not attending BUC, oh, sorry, 16 years of attending BUC on and off, I am so excited to officially become a member today. I invite you to join me now as we move further into a spirit of prayer and centering. We are gathered this morning in the presence of each other and in honor of those who have come before us to create beloved community, to share in the joys and the sorrows and the mystery of wonder of each other's lives to find a way to make sense of it all, to see ourselves reflected in ritual, in liturgy, in each other, in smiles and in song. 
This morning we carry with us joys and sorrows that remain too tender to be shared, things that are on our heart that we're not ready to say out loud yet. We bring with us people who we have not written down, but we know that we care about. I invite you now to share the names of those who might be on your heart this morning. We hold these beloved in warmth and in love. We hold these beloved in compassion. We hold each other in warmth and love. We hold each other in accountability and concern. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be. Our reading this morning is an excerpt from an essay titled The Inherent Worth and Dignity of Every Person. It was written by Reverend Sarah Lammert, and you can find it in the book titled The Seven Principles in Word and Worship. Historically, the affirmation of the inherent worth and dignity of every person was first articulated by the American or in the American Unitarian context as a direct attack on the Calvinist orthodoxy of the 19th century. William Ellery Channing and other Unitarian ministers of his day protested the idea that humans are fundamentally depraved. Instead, Channing presented a vision of, a, of the perfectibility of the human mind and spirit. He suggested that a spark of divinity resides within each of us, and similarly, our universalist forebears emphasized the goodness of creation and the promise of salvation for all through the grace of a loving and beneficent God. What began as a theological position has evolved over the past century of Unitarian Universalism into a more humanist understanding of inherent worth and dignity as an ethical basis for living. Rather than referring to the divine within each connecting a person to a larger whole, our first principle has become something of a celebration of individualism. On the positive side, this means that we strive to affirm and respect differences, fueling our commitment to a faith that rejects oppressions of all kinds. On the negative side, we have made something of an idol of the individual. We mistake the affirmation of individual worth and dignity 
for a kind of defensive arrogance about our own political point of view. Nope, she didn't say political, that was me paging Dr. Freud. Um, <laughs> arrogance about our own particular point of view, excuse me. Sarah Lambert continues, we need to embrace an expanded view of the self in which the first and seventh principles are inextricably linked. Like the ancient Aurora Boris, the snake or the dragon that devours its own tail, symbolizing a constant process of creation. The self does not exist outside of community, but is a function of our network of relationships. I have my own body with its protective layer of skin and its interior structure that sustain my life. And of course, we are each unique with individual thoughts and talents. But my skin is merely a porous fiber that interacts with the larger world, not a true boundary of self. I did not give myself life, and I do not sustain my own life. As a people, indeed, as a part of the larger web of existence, our fortunes rise and fall together.
here we are, beginning of the second month of the church year. We made it through the first month. Still don't have the AV figured out, but we will. We will. <laughs> so this year, our monthly worship themes are organized around our Unitarian Universalist principles. There are currently seven principles. I think you heard Nico earlier say eight, because there is a movement underway to adopt an eighth explicitly anti-oppressive, anti-racist principle. I'm proud to say that our high school youth group, Goosh, has already adopted that principle and did so last year. As typical, they are way ahead of us, and I'm excited for us to explore that eighth principle and hopefully catch up with them. We will get a wider exploration of that principle later this year as well, but we're going in numerical order. So today we'll start with the first principle. Unitarian Universalism is a covenantal religious tradition. That means that we make covenants with one another that explicitly state our aspirations for how we will treat one another. The eight principles are an association-wide covenant that begins we, the congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant and affirm to promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And then it goes on from there. I think a lot of times we forget that the principles are actually our covenant. They are. Inherent worth and dignity is the first principle, and then the other principles are listed after that. As Sarah Lambert indicated in the essay that was today's reading, the first principle is a descendant of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Its roots can be traced back to the idea that humanity was created in God's own image and therefore some level of likeness to God is in each of us. Other religious traditions share a similar perspective, but our theological lineage leans heavily to the Judeo-Christian tradition, specifically the Unitarians and the Universalists. The Unitarian Universalist Association was formed in 1961 through the merger of the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America. Both denominations were historically Christian, but they were never accepted in mainstream Christianity. The Unitarians and the Universalists most certainly had their differences, but they shared enough in common to make a merger Possible, and I think it is important to always note that the youth led the way there as well. The youth co um, combined and merged before the larger associations did. The concept of inherent worth and dignity is one of those shared theological points between the Unitarians and the Universalists, who did not really get along, but they shared some ideas. And the primary doctrine, because our forebears had doctrines, we don't, but they did, the primary doctrine of the Universalists was universal salvation. Basically, they believed that God found all of humanity worthy of salvation, which was already given, no opt-outs, everybody was in. So the tie there to the first principle is pretty apparent. The Unitarians did not share that perspective. They liked the idea of hell for some people, but they could agree <laughs> They did. <laughs> Have you ever read? Okay, we'll do that later. <laughs> they liked the idea of hell for some people, but they could agree with the Universalists that humans were not condemned to hell as a, con a condition of their birth. Rather, they believed in a beneficent God who had endowed humanity with goodness, and then some people were going to hell, and that was their own fault. The stance and a beneficent God who had endowed people with inherent goodness was first declared as Unitarian theology at the very moment that a faction of liberal theologians and preachers in Boston declared themselves to be Unitarians all at the same time. And that happened in a single sermon, it was an hour and a half long, a single sermon by William Ellery Channing that we today call the Baltimore Sermon. At that time it was called the Unitarian Sermon, but today we call it the Baltimore Sermon. And at that time, which was the early 19th century, the majority of Protestant churches in New England were called Standing Order Churches. And they were the descendants of Puritans. Puritan churches were organized around the same concept that we organize today, and that is mutual concern, mutual consent, rather than mutual belief. Those churches had formed out of necessity 
and there had always been a certain tolerance for theological differences in those churches. Now, when we read what they believed, it all sounds really narrow, and what really is the difference between these small ideas, but to them, it was a really big deal. They didn't always get along, and as the cities and the towns grew, it became possible to split those churches along lines of belief, and that's exactly what was happening in the context of William Ellery Channing. As the more liberal ministers preached about the unity of God rather than the Trinity, things reached a breaking point. And they hit the, uh, the Unitarian controversy, which I think we should call the Trinitarian controversy. And they started splitting up, tensions escalated, and then people turned as they do to name calling. The word Unitarian was used as an epithet against those liberal preachers and after enough time, people, as they do, decided to reclaim that word as a point of pride and distinguish themselves. I, and I am a Unitarian and I'm proud of it. The Baltimore Sermon by William Ellery Channing declared that yes, he was a Unitarian. And not only did he reject the, the doctrine of the Trinity, he also rejected the doctrine of original sin. I imagine there was a lot of pearl clutching at that moment. He specifically rejected the Calvinist doctrine of total depravity. Can we just take a minute to appreciate 33-year-old William Ellery Channing publicly declaring a 1,500-year-old doctrine was nonsense and what that took for him to do? The doctrine of original sin comes from Augustine of Hippo, and it was developed in the mid-14th century. It's been around for a long time, but that doesn't make it true. From its inception, the doctrine of original sin has been and continues to be used by religious leaders, the aristocracy, and the ruling class to exploit and oppress everyone who isn't a part of that nexus of power starting with women. Augustine believed that one of the creation stories found in the book of Genesis, there are two, and he believed that one indisputably proves that Eve was responsible for introducing sin into the world and her sin irreparably corrupted all of humanity. And wouldn't you know it, the idea that women are evil caught on like wildfire. <laughs> People disputed Augustine's supposition from the beginning but it was hard to go against that power nexus of the wealthy, the rulers, and the church. And we are the spiritual descendants from that long line of glorious heretics that did not and would not give Augustine or any human the right to set doctrine, to place constraints, or describe the nature of God. There have always been voices of dissent those who have risked everything to provide a different perspective, to raise questions, to cast doubts. Why does that guy get to say who God is and what God wills? Why does that guy get to say there is a God? What if there isn't? And all of this is just a way to keep power over others. Those heretics, they were threats to the unholy trinity of power of the rich the ruling class and the religious authorities. Our heretical forebears were hunted down, they were tortured, they were martyred for their beliefs. Do not ever forget that people have fought and died to give us our free religious tradition. And because of their sacrifices, we have inherited a religion with no doctrine and no creed. We have found that doctrine and that creed are exploited to oppress people and furthermore, they are idolatries that prevent free religious exploration. Channing's public renunciation of original sin and the Trinity was groundbreaking. It was an important step in defining the American Unitarian movement. It opened a path for our current theologies which center the primacy of human relationships. Placing human relationships at the center of our religious tradition is due in no small part to the contributions of humanism. 
in the late 20th century, after the merger of the Unitarians and the Universalists, humanism became an important part of the, the theological and the philosophical stew that is modern Unitarian Universalism. Humanism is deeply concerned with human well-being. Whether they consider themselves as secular humanists or religious humanists, all humanists are deeply committed to creating and living in a world that fosters equitable human relationships in which the needs of all humans are tended to with love. For humanists, the answer to theological questions begins and ends with the human experience. And therefore, the idea of starting off as somehow inherently wrong is totally meaningless. It has no resonance. From all of these perspectives, universalist, Unitarian and humanist, the covenant of the congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association begins with the declaration that each human is born with inherent worth and dignity. Not right, not wrong, worthy, deserving of dignity, and the rest is up to you. Each of us has the capacity for good and evil, and it is our choices that shape the world. We did have a second reading this morning. It was a movie clip. It did not work out. One of our youth spent a good deal of time yesterday trying to make it work out, but unfortunately it didn't. It was a clip from our shared sacred text of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> In this text, Harry Potter is talking with his godfather, Sirius Black, and Harry tells Sirius that he thinks that he might be turning into a bad person. He's had some evidence that he's more like Voldemort than he realized and that he's comfortable with. And so he says to him, I'm just angry all the time. And what if I'm becoming like Voldemort? And Sirius says, Harry, I want you to listen very closely to me. You are not a bad person. You are a good person whom very bad things have happened to. Besides, the world isn't split into light and dark. There's not good people and death eaters. All of us have good and evil in us. It's what we choose to act on that makes us who we are. Harry Potter is a very theological text and fundamentally humanist. This idea that our choices make us who we are is an essential part of Unitarian Universalist theology. We do not have doctrines, but we do have theology. There are theological constructs that hold us together, and we are each responsible for creating individual theologies, or perhaps a theologies for some, that include those kernels. We share an overarching covenant that gives shape to our lives together, those eight principles. The principles are the boundaries within which we create our personal theology. We often think of the principles as providing protection for us to develop those theologies. They are a shield against others imposing their beliefs on us. And they are. We tend to say inherent worth and dignity of the individual as a proscriptive, meaning don't do things to take away from the inherent worth and dignity of others, or perhaps more common to take away from my inherent worth and dignity. It is almost always a euphemism for being able to do and believe whatever one wants. It is almost exclusively used uh, as a shield against accountability for bad behavior. And I, my challenge to you, dear ones, is to tweak that perspective. What might happen if we think of our first principle Rather than being proscriptive, don't take away inherent worth and dignity, but we think about it as an affirmation of people's inherent worth and dignity, meaning that we must behave in a way that proactively protects the inherent worth and dignity of others, rather than defensively saying my worth and dignity, but thinking about treating people in a way that affirms their inherent worth and dignity. Let's turn that outward. So rather than being don't do this, turn it into do this actively doing things to affirm rather than passively not doing something that takes away. Our covenants are behavioral aspirations. How we treat each other, how we behave, the things that we believe that support our behaviors have to align with our covenants, or at least 
it should be our goal that they align with our covenants. Our principles, our primary covenant, are not a doctrine. It's not a creed. There is no such thing as Unitarian Universalist orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means right belief. We are a heterodox tradition, which means that there are several right beliefs. We do not have orthodoxy, but we do have orthopraxy, which means right practice. Our beliefs can be wide ranging, but they must support behavior that is in accordance with our covenants. Remember, people have worth and dignity, behaviors do not. Our principles, all eight of them, are meant to be taken together. We don't get to cherry pick and use just the first and the seventh. They interact with and they support each other. The interaction between the first principle, which is the inherent worth and dignity, and the seventh, which is respect for the interdependent web of life of which we are all a part, have to be in conversation. And they have to be in conversation with the other principles. We are shaped by the communities that raise us. And likewise, we shape the communities of which we are a part, that Aurora Boris, that Sarah Lambert talked about. We are a constant flux of emotion. We are in a constant state of co-creation of our individual and our corporate identities. We are never done. We are always making choices that determine who we are. One does not exist, the individual and the corporate. One does not exist without the other. There is no such thing as an individual outside of community. Even a hermit who lives alone, lives alone in opposition to living in a town. His identity as a person who lives separately could not exist without a community from which to live separately. His identity is bound to the community as much as the baker or the school teacher. We are always inextricably bound to each other and the human project. Our behaviors create the world, set the conditions for that project. We've entered into covenants, both the principles and the covenant of this congregation that we think, that we hope, will build the world that we dream about. We dream of a world where no one is born under the shadow of a doctrine that tells them who they are and that who they are is wrong. We dream of a world that affirms the worth and dignity of every person, not passively acknowledging, but actively affirming. We dream of a world where we consider the impact of our actions and how they build up or tear down that world. We dream of a world where the individual supports the community and the community supports the individual and the ongoing cycle of creation. We dream of a world of fairness and equity that is grounded in the unshakable belief and the inherent worth and dignity of each one of us. May that world be so.
to this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. <laughs>